Heartland Flags and Gifts presents Legends and Listeners with Scott Docterman and Chad Leistico. Fly them high and fly them proud. Find your flag at heartlandflags.com. Breaking down the Big Ten from the Channel Seat Studios, this is Iowa Everywhere. Hey, Hawkeye fans, Big Ten fans, and Iowans everywhere. Welcome to episode 23 of Legends and Listeners here on the Iowa Everywhere Network, live from the Channel Seed Studios. Uh, my name is Chad Leistico. I'm here joined with Scott Docterman, as always. Uh, Scott, so you inspired me to uh, tinker with this format today. Your piece in The Athletic, uh, I think you published it yesterday. Yeah. Talked about uh, Gus Schrader's, uh, you know, what, what was it called? Like the hash? Yeah, pass know? the hash. Pass yeah. the hash, okay, which is just kind of a potpourri of topics. And as Scott pointed out, we're both Cedar Rapids Gazette alums, uh, yeah. so it works out pretty well here. So we're going to do that today on Legends and Listeners. Uh, we've got five topics lined up, Scott. Uh, should be a pretty fun show. We'll try to be pretty fast with each topic, but there's a lot to unpack, is there not, uh, with Iowa Athletics right now? Yeah, there's a lot of hash there. And uh, before we start, I do want to congratulate you. You know, you've been mentioning me winning awards. You are you and Tommy Birch are both just absolutely deserving of Iowa Sports Writer of the Year sharing the award uh, for this year. And and so I, I got it last year. You got it this year. Um, much congratulations, my friend. Well, thank you. And uh, yeah. Congratulations to Iowa everywhere, right? They got the yeah. two sports writers of the year here. We just need to get Tommy on, I guess. But yeah, yeah. thank you so much. Um, and and it, let's get right to it. There's been news this morning, Scott. It was uh, announced by the university that Beth Getz uh, has been named permanent AD, uh, the full-time athletics director. She succeeds Gary Barta officially after, what, about five months, five and a half months in the interim uh, uh, positioned, I guess you could say. Obviously, everybody who has listened to us for a while knows that we're uh, big fans of what Beth Getz has done for Iowa. I think it's a great hire. Uh, I don't think they could have found anyone better. And they did search and and interviewed sitting ads uh, across the country. And uh, Beth Getz, uh, no surprise to us, becomes their top choice. Why don't you uh, take it from here? Yeah. Uh, as we know, when she was hired here at Iowa in 2022, after being after four years as a little over four years as the Ball State Athletic Director, uh, I automatically I went, whoa, OK, they're they're not playing around with this role. This is a good move. It's kind of like with Jean Taylor, but a, but a little different because she had served as interim AD at, at Minnesota before. She was the number two at UConn. Um, she was uh, the second choice at Wisconsin uh, a few years ago when Chris McIntosh replaced Barry Alvarez. So it automatically looked like she might have this role. It's just a matter of how long was Gary Barta going to be there uh, to whether or not it was here at Iowa. But once she became interim AD, once Gary announced his retirement in May and a and she became the interim AD officially the day after Barta's retirement on August 2nd. Uh, we, it was like the clock was running. Okay, she had an opportunity to prove herself worthy of that role. I think we all expected her to. She has a, you know, a, a, she's built up a, a lot of goodwill, great relationships, both internally and externally at the University of Iowa. She's had to have some very difficult things thrown at her. Um, certainly the situation with Brian Ferentz was as difficult as any AD would ever have to face, at least among the coaching situations. And yet uh, she came through it all in, in strong, with stronger support and did it in, you know, as well as she could possibly do it. So, uh, you know, it, it was somewhat of a foregone conclusion, but they did the process. It probably took too long, but ultimately this is the decision they came to and it was the right one. And, uh, you know, so she has a chance now to reinvent or, or reestablish Iowa as a national leader and also look forward. And I think her vision, Chad, to me is something that, you know, in talking with her publicly and privately, I think is something that's well needed in this time and uh, an era of, of college athletics. 
I want to follow up with you on that, but I do want to give her kudos for the crossover at Kinnick. Pulling mm-hmm. that off was a, was a, I want to, I don't want to say it was all her, but she, yeah. uh, she made that happen and didn't hesitate. And it was a perfect event uh, and they um, executed it really well. I would say in my opinion, and I don't know maybe how many percentage of the audience would share this opinion. I think she, uh, even though it wasn't solely her decision, um, you know, to dismiss Brian Ferentz, I think that decision has been validated um, over the past three months since it's happened. And um, no, even though they don't have an OC yet, uh, I think that it was necessary. And I don't know if Kirk Ferentz would have fired his son mm-hmm. with that move. So um, I think that that she deserves credit for that. It was a tough thing to do. And we know Barbara Wilson um, was at the the front of that decision, but still Beth had to deliver the news and navigate, you know, the awkwardness after that. And she's done that. And she has the respect of so many coaches, Tom Brands, Fran McCaffrey, Lisa Bluter. Um, and now, Rick Heller. yeah, Rick Heller, yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, I'm in, uh, I'm, she's, she's the only female AD in the big 10, right? At this point, yeah. And point, when, you, so, when USC joins, then you know, she'll be one of two. One of two. Okay. So, um, you know, and that's that's notable. You know, the first first time um, overseeing the whole department, yeah. um, you know, since Christine Grant and, you know, Bump shared, shared the honors, I guess, way back when. So, and Bob Bowlesby, of course. So, anyway, just a long-winded answer to say that I, I feel like she's done a great job, you know, like, validating her uh, case for this job. And you mentioned her vision. So why don't you speak more to what you see from her maybe in the coming days, weeks, years um, in the Beth Getz era of Iowa athletics? Yeah, I think among the things that we've talked about, um, both on and off record, things regarding student athlete, not only welfare, but dealing with in the NIL era, we know that there's going to be shared resources Um, you know, and payment from from the athletics department to athletes. It's going to happen. And she realizes that. And she also wants to make it work. She, you know, the conversations with uh, the head of Iowa's collective, the Iowa Swarm, I mean, she realizes and understands how important that is and made that a priority. Is it as much of uh, you know, have the, how have the conversations gone? They've been up and down, but they're, they're at least there. Um, And the, and the, you know, I would say the commitment is there. Uh, one of the topics I found most fascinating with her that really resonates with Iowa fans is um, her desire to have the students, at, you know, around the court at, at Carver Hawkeye Arena. She says you can tell the difference in the atmosphere, you know, when they do that. There, there's a feasibility study underway with Carver Hawkeye Arena. It's probably going to get shrunk, um, but every when everything changes it's going to change for the better because as we've seen now, the women's games are off the charts. We know that wrestling meets are, are fantastic. Men's basketball is not right now. And, and that's the environment part of it. And she understands it. And she wants to deal with it. So she has a vision that to, to bring Iowa forward. And when you, when I've had a lot of conversations with ADs around the big 10, of, of, you know, not necessarily about her, but about other topics. And one of the things that, you know, one in particular, you know, said to me is like, we sat down and he's like, okay, before we go on record, Beth's going to get that right. You know, and that's kind of been the sentiment that everybody respects her and her voice is, she walks into the room and people want to hear her voice. And Bowlesby was that way. Um, I'm not so sure Gary was, Gary did a lot of really good things. Um, and, but he was more of a conservative fashion faction that right now is probably not needed with this changing uh, landscape of college athletics. And uh, Beth Getz will uh, meet the media on Tuesday to discuss some of these things. So we'll hear from her Tuesday at 2.30 p.m. So, um, yeah, uh, good stuff there. We try. I'm, I'm going to try to keep these on schedule, Scott, two minutes apiece uh, as we move along. But first, I do want to give a shout out to our sponsor, uh, Heartland Flags and Gifts, thank you for uh, uh, being our title sponsor. They offer free shipping anywhere in the U.S., always have new products, nearly every sport, every team, and every flag. Visit our good friends online at heartlandflags.com or in-store 
at 3719 Southwest 9th Street in Des Moines. Uh, Scott, uh, let's move on to football. And uh, Caden Proctor becomes a headline again in our state. Uh, he enters the transfer portal. Uh, it was really cool for me to see uh, you and – uh, Kennington Smith worked together on a piece yesterday mm -hmm. at the athletic. Of course, uh, skinny Kenny was a, a yeah. two year partner for me, uh, at the register and a, and a wonderful friend in mm -hmm. addition to being a great, uh, work teammate. And, uh, he's still a loyal Hawk central listener. And I love that. Yeah. He, he was texting me yesterday. I'm listening to the pod. You <laughs> know, and, uh, um, so anyway, it was good to see. And it's, and it's, you know, he covered the, he was here for when Caden flipped, yeah, uh, for uh, for <laughs> Alabama the day before signing day, and now Caden's back in the portal. You know, after the news that Nick Saban retires at Alabama, so uh, I read your your whole piece with him. Uh, how could I not? Yeah. Uh, what uh, <laughs> What do you make of you know? It, it really seems like there's a lot of buzz that that Caden will end up in Iowa City. We will see. We know he's waffled before a little bit, but uh, this would be a pretty Pretty, pretty good development for the Iowa football program. Oh, for sure. And 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 this is, you know, I, I went back and read, you know, and, and listened to Tyler Barnes, the recruiting director at Iowa, what he said that day after he flipped on signing day in 2022. And then we, you know, pri you know side conversations. But, you know, I, I, what he said is the reason why this is even a possibility. And that is that they worked their ass off to try to get him here to Iowa. And he was committed to Iowa for almost six months and then flipped at the end and saw the Alabama. And it's, it's hard when you get those stars in your eyes. I mean, Marcus Page going to North Carolina instead of Iowa, you know, things like that. It just happens. However, um, in his case, he, uh, uh, you know, Tyler said, you know, I, I texted him. I texted the family. Good luck to you. We're in your corner. But, you know, here's the, the way that the transfer portal works. You just never know. And and so he goes down there and, and he struggled a little bit on the field, but he, but he also started every game as a true freshman at, at left tackle for the University of Alabama, that, which qualified for the Final Four, by the way. Um, now with Nick Saban's uh, departure, it enters the transfer portal, homesick it sounds like you know how how you know I, I think there's a couple of questions Chad and, and you were there as well through this oral deal you know there was some significant social media spats between some Iowa fans and the family I don't know if they're able to get past that um, but I think you know, when you look at Kanan Proctor he has great relationships with the players that he committed with you know and saw frequently on the sidelines and then also with somebody like Xavier Wampa, who he played with at Southeast Polk. So uh, what do you make of this, Chad? And is this a realistic possibility? And if so, how does this impact Iowa in 2024 and beyond? Yeah, I, at this point, I would be surprised if he doesn't come here. Um, I think it's it's a strong possibility. It's not a done deal, of course. But uh, I think that Usually when guys go in the portal, usually, especially the big ones, they have a good idea where they're going. We've we've learned that in this early in the early stages of the portal era. That doesn't mean it's finalized. I'm sure I'm sure he's got a lot of people kind of coming at him all of a sudden because that's a five star number one offensive tackle in the country. And uh, there's a lot of major programs out there that, you know, have a lot of money in their collective. So I don't want to say it's a done deal by any means, but. Um, you know, I, I've under, I believe his girlfriend goes to Creighton. I think that's a factor in this whole thing as well. Uh, I don't want, I don't have, you know, Caden quoted on that, but I believe that's part of the equation from what I know. Um, so there's, there's a lot of factors kind of bringing him home. We saw Xavier Wampa's tweet yesterday with just the smiley face or whatever. It's about 24 hours ago. Right. And, uh, you know, Xavier doesn't do much social media, but he is, uh, he is a upstanding young man, also a five star who kind of, you know, was, you know, a sidekick of Proctor's of sorts just a year ahead of him. And we know Xavier has had a really good experience in the Iowa program. And I was just when I was thinking about this whole thing, um, I was just thinking about 
a tweet I sent, and I, I don't know if you sent it too, but just just listing all the Hawkeyes in the NFL quarterfinals right now, like, yeah, if you come here, there's a really good – you're not going to hurt your NFL stock by any means. And uh, it's a way to come home. It's a way to uh, – and I, I think he'll get paid pretty handsomely um, collective-wise if, if that comes to fruition. So there's a lot to be excited about. I, I do want to talk about his on-field impact too, but I, I feel good about where this is going for Iowa. For sure. I mean, Iowa's in the game. And, you know, as Bob Bowlesby said 20 years ago, if, if you're not in the game, you know, the only thing worse than being in the arms race is not being in the arms race. And I think that's including in, in these players. And, and, you know, really, when you look back, what did Iowa lose by not having him here for one season? I mean, yes, he could have he probably would have started and he probably would have played a, a big role. But what he played well. Eh, probably up and down, maybe as well, if not a little bit better than some of the other players. But now they got the potential to bring him in and have him take over at left tackle and be their guy. Something that they, you know, Alec Jackson was tremendous as a run blocker out of that position, and they could really use that uh, this year. So on the field, it really matters. And then, you know, he's built up great relationships with those players in the 2022 class or, you know, that would have, well, 2023, I guess would have been, but the players that signed then. And as we mentioned, Xavier Wampa, you know, I think back and Caden Proctor when he was a sophomore, uh, right after COVID open, uh, the, everything opened with COVID, he had, he came to Iowa's first open practice. And I sat with him in the end zone, um, at that uh, like kids day event. And we, we sat for probably half an hour and talked and he's wearing an Iowa shirt. Then um, I went to, to Xavier's signing. Um, he was one of the last people to leave. He was all in on Iowa. He's, you know, he, he wore 74 because of Tristan works. So there's a lot uh, there. And, and again, when we look back, Chad, when we were 17, 18 years old, and we all had wanderlust. We all wanted to go to big places, fun places, exciting places. Florida State and Arizona State were two that I know I remember. Yeah, everybody wanted to go to for my school. You know, just sounded cool and fun. But, you know, he had his experience, and now he looks back, and, you know, Iowa won 10 games as well. You know, Iowa was not some – it's not going to, like, five and sevenville. I mean, they're going – he'd be going to a program that has – I think 14 players still in the NFL uh, playing this weekend that I think it's second most among the, the teams in the country. I was tight end you, I was at, a, you know, three, they have two starting left tackles in the NFL, you know, and they have a pro bowl center. So th there's a lot to like about Iowa. And I think he understands that and knew it through the whole case. It's just a matter of now, you know, now just putting it all together. Yeah, that's right. Anybody who watched that Rams Lions game, and I, I know a lot of us did. Um, mm -hmm. You know, as uh, kind of uh, half-hearted Lions fans now with uh, Laporta and Campbell there. I know I'm looking at you, Scott. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, I, I got a Lions football over my head here, but I, that was for my son when he was born. But anyway. but yeah, <laughs> Alaric Jackson was a starting left tackle for the Rams in yeah. that game. So as you mentioned, um, you know, you can get to the NFL from Iowa. Uh, on the offensive line, just like you can tight end, just like you can defensive back. So, yeah, it would make – I mean, he's he's 6'7", 360, Scott. Uh, that's what he's listed at at Alabama. Uh, Iowa doesn't have anybody like that. They don't have that anchor left tackle. But, you know, Mason Richmond uh, I think would be outstanding uh, if the, he could kick inside the guard, mm -hmm. to use our old – one of our favorite phrases from NFL draft uh, the lingo. Yeah. I think – the left guard spot is a question mark next year. And I think Mason Richmond, honestly, that could be perfect for him, especially mm -hmm. as he ascends to the next level potentially. So, I mean, if you give me a line, a starting point line of Proctor, Richmond, uh, Jones slash Ellsbury, um, Connor Colby, who's probably their best mm -hmm. NFL prospect on the line right now. And Jennings Dunker, who honestly uh, really solidified that right mm -hmm. tackle spot this past season. And, and I, I think is, is a tackle. I mean, he could mm -hmm. be a guard, but maybe at the next yeah. level, but he is a tackle in college. I like that starting five as a starting point, even without the offensive coordinator here yet. Absolutely. Um, and then you throw on Nick DeYoung, who's coming back for a sixth year, and he could be a really good swing man. And as you mentioned, uh, Tyler Ellsbury, uh, Bo Stevens. I mean, so then, 
So they're at, the, they would be at the point that you would really, that they need to be, that they were several years ago, which is you have depth and you have experience and, and you have, you know, an ascending group. And as you mentioned, I mean, Mason already knew that he's not going to be left tackle in the NFL, that he's going to kick inside the guard, but, but that's his, you know, that's, that's where he's going to be. And if you're going to have him, you know, three year starter from left tackle, move inside. Uh, Connor Colby, I thought when he was healthy, looked like he was an ascending player. Uh, Jennings Dunker is going to only get better. I thought Logan Jones, when he's healthy, is is an ass kicker, you know. And when you can have that coalesce, that's just what one piece does for a unit, because especially up front, because then you just adjust everybody and you get your best five out there. And then I think Caden Proctor. Um, he has this, you know, it, he could be at least a Lyric Jackson who I thought him and, and to me, the, the most underrated players I've covered at Iowa were Alaric Jackson and Christian Kirksey, because we just didn't talk about him enough. And that last year in 2020, Chad, their run game was elite. It was, you know, they were averaging four, six a carry. And it was because the way Alaric Jackson could run that outside zone. They haven't been able to run the outside zone since then at all. And, and, and it's been poor, but I think with Caden Proctor, they have the opportunity to do that. And, and then if they can with this stable running backs, I think this, these, this running back room is really good. It just needs a little more improvement up front. Yeah, no question. And uh, you bring back Luke Lachey too. Mm-hmm. you know, the, the pieces are there for a potential offensive coordinator to, uh, come in here and do some stuff and, and make some changes and make some positive changes, Scott. So let's get to our third topic in the past the hash <laughs> version of Legends and Listeners here. And that, of course, is probably the hottest topic, uh, maybe not the newsiest, mm-hmm. but definitely the hottest topic, which is offensive coordinator. The search continues. Paul Christ uh, had the opportunity to take the job, declined, staying at Texas. Uh, don't, you know, don't have confirmation on why that uh, – went down the way it did, but Iowa does have to kind of start over there. I feel like this was, I feel like that's the guy Kirk Ferentz had in his mind all along back when he talked to us in December, it doesn't pan out. Uh, It made so much sense. We've talked about it in this show, Uh, but now it's, uh, you know, we wait longer. Uh, They did say in the near future, we'll get to some of those offensive staff changes here, or coaching staff changes a little bit later in our fourth segment here. But Scott, uh, what do you where do you react to kind of the the length that this offensive coordinator search is taking and where Iowa goes next? I kind of fluctuate, Chad, between frustration and aggravation to, you know, okay, why am I feeling that way? And it doesn't really matter. And ultimately, the what what matters the most is getting the position right. And getting the best person for Iowa to fill that role who will work well with staff, who will put together a game plan that that represents Iowa and what Iowa wants to be, but do it in fashion, winning fashion, frankly. And and so whether it's today, next week, February 2nd, which would be perfect Groundhog Day uh, for this uh, position uh, to be filled, but what what does it really matter? And all, all that matters is they get it right. Now, I thought, you thought that Paul Christ was the right fit. What happened there? I don't really know. I'm not privy to all those details. Did he, you know, and we can only speculate, you know, did it not, why did it not fit? Was there enough money? Was there enough um, autonomy? You know, was it, hey, I I don't want to go there with that quarterback situation, you know, all that, or just, you know what, I just want to try to work on it this way. Maybe I don't want a long-term commitment at Iowa. I, you know, we can only speculate at this moment. But so, but then we start to look at obviously who could fill that role, Chad. And you know, I, I spent way too much on Monday night after watching Ben Keeter's match and and the playoff game, trying to figure out all right, who are some names that I could at least throw out there and look like I'm not an idiot and saying I don't know. You know, first one that comes to mind to me is Tommy Reese, um, former Notre Dame quarterback, former Notre Dame OC who went to Alabama this year. Um, with Nick Saban retired, Kalen DeBoer left Washington for Alabama, brought Ryan Grubb with him, leaves Tommy Reese kind of out there. And part of what makes it work for me is that Tommy Reese has run offenses that are Iowa-like. 
they're not they're not extravagant they're not air raid they're not you know something that Kirk Ferentz would be uncomfortable with and he has experience there he's had experience competing at a high level and um and if you're Tommy Reese it you know does it look like it's a step down maybe a tad but not that much and if you go and fix Iowa well, let's face it Chad if this offense is fixed I think we're covering a playoff game in December this year with this defense back. And if Iowa's defense is fixed and you're Tommy Reese, you can become a head coach pretty quickly off this. So, uh, but then there are tons of others that I'm just throwing names out there, but that's the one that I've kind of been fixated on. I don't know if there's anything to it. If I'm just throwing a name out there just to throw it out there, but what, what are your thoughts right now? Yeah. I mean, I think, I think it's back to square one, uh, honestly, for, for the search, which stinks, uh, we, you know, my reporting indicates Joe Philbin's not going to be the guy either. We've talked about him a lot. Um, some of the pie in the sky options, uh, you know, also had, had not come to fruition for whatever reason. Um, I, I've, I've got the feeling it's going to be someone from the NFL. Kirk Ferentz has kind of teased that, mm-hmm. you know, he's got connections in the NFL, a lot of connections, in the NFL, uh, he mentioned yeah, there's a new market of people in January, and you know there's a there's going to be some offensive coordinators off good NFL staffs. You know there's eight opening or seven now, but eight NFL coach changes this off season that we know of, and we don't. Maybe Andy Reid retires after this year too. Who knows? Matt Nagy coming to Iowa City, right? No, I'm just kidding. Um, I'm, I had to do a Bears reference there. I I'd say Luke Getze I would yeah. swallow, but Luke, Luke Nagy, yeah. Mark yeah. Pressman, where are you going with this? <laughs> so, so there's just a, there's a lot of possibilities out there right now. Um, I like, you know, if if it was going to be a college guy and you thought, ah, oh, what is Kirk Ferentz doing? Well, you know, if he locks into Tommy Reese somehow, you know, by this happenstance, that would be a pretty nice accident. And it's not like Tommy Reese is like, you know, I don't feel like it would be like a step down, really. I mean, he it was one year coordinator at Alabama. Before that, he was a six year quarterbacks coach at Notre Dame, you know, which, you know, didn't light the world on fire offensively. Um, you know, it's it's not like he's like the hot name in football. And I feel like it could be a nice fit, like you said. And I don't know if there's any, um, you know any legs to it at all, but I, you know, he did have a, a year under Pat Fitzgerald in 2015 at, at Northwestern as a grad assistant. I mean, that's, that's a connection that, Hey, Kirk Ferentz can make a phone call to, to Pat Fitzgerald with a, they have a mutual respect, you know, and get a little recommendation. We know South Wallace is close to Pat Fitzgerald. Hey, here's a guy you can work with. Can we work with him? You know, Kirk wants that guy that's going to fit, be a team player. I hesitate to think he's going to go young, I know a lot of fans right. want him to. I think it's probably more likely uh, the over under age on the coordinator is probably if you set it at fifty and a half, I'd probably go over. Um, but uh, I don't know. That's just where my thoughts are. We just it just sucks that all my you know I got I had two pre written coordinator columns done and I was happy with them both and those are going in the trash. Yeah. I know if people knew the, the, the stories that have been, you know, the turned out to be like the Tupac hologram, you know, of, of journalism, of how many stories have died, you know, whether it's that or it's been, uh, you know, live game coverage and, and everything. It's, it's, it's insane. But no, I, I know that's kind of the, the fallback for Iowa is to go with somebody that, you know, with Kirk, it's somebody he's comfortable with, probably somebody of an older persuasion, you know, how do, how do they view the world, how do they view football, the NFL style of play is a little bit closer to what he wants, who's it going to be, you know, and there are a lot of, you know, again, the, the, the merry-go-round is still spinning right now in the NFL. I mean, his teams get whittled out and I know Mike McCarthy, there was a lot of speculation. He was going to get fired from Dallas and it didn't happen. Um, but you know, I mean, the, the closest one obviously is Bill O'Brien, you know, from the Patriots and Alabama and Penn state. He tried to hire Brian both at the Houston Texans and at Penn state. Um, Kirk has brought him in for clinics tons of times. They, they have a great relationship there. 
Would that be someone that he would feel comfortable with? But then would Bill O'Brien want to feel, would he feel comfortable in that role for, you know, a year, two years, three years, whatever it's going to be. I don't know. You know, somebody, you know, the, the Bears faction, but somebody that I, I also thought about, Dow Logan, Logan, you know, who's used to be with the Bears. He's now the OC and quarterbacks coach um, with South Carolina. <laughs> You're shaking your head. But, you know, he's been OC or quarterbacks coach at the Jets and uh, the Browns, the Dolphins, the Bears, you know, just on and on, you know. There's just all you know, we're we're throwing names out there right now. You know we don't have you know some seriousness there, and probably Kirk's going ha ha ha. I'm glad, but but it is frustrating for us when we have to cover this program and we got decent intelligence before, and now it's like uh, we're impatiently waiting for better intelligence. Sure, um, we assume he's moving on it pretty quick now because there yeah. is a little bit of a time crunch. You want to get you know, an offense, you know, constructed in February so you can start coaching it in March. So there mm -hmm. is, you can't wait forever on this thing. Right. Um, you know, we've also, you know, been led to believe it's not going to be John Budmeyer. I know that yeah. really, people are panicked that it's going to be him. I don't, it will not be no. him. Um, so uh, two questions for you, Scott, and then we'll move to our next topic. And we went a little long on this one. What is your prediction when this will happen? We don't have to say who, but when will Kirk Ferentz land this many? And two, if Bill Belichick gets the Atlanta Falcons job, is that where Brian gets his coaching uh, next step? Mm, great, where, great. Where, he, where he played, uh, you know, had a cup of coffee as a player <laughs> in the NFL with the Falcons, right? Yeah, he had his jersey with his name on it. You know, that's yeah. that's always what I say with these, those guys. And, uh, you know, to answer the the back one, I think where Bill Belichick or potentially somebody like Brian Flores, who I know he's very close to, you know, defensive coordinator with the Minnesota Vikings, I think where they end up, if they both end up as head coaches, I think that's, you know, it's reasonable to suggest that Brian Ferentz will end up as a, an assistant coach because he's well thought of by those people. And, and people under, you know, we can all poo poo his era as offensive coordinator at Iowa, but, but as a positional coach, he's, he's very well thought of at that level. So yeah, I think the Bill Belichick or, or Brian Flores would hire him pretty or, you know, pretty, you know, quickly um, as an assistant there. Now, as far as when this is going to wrap up, I, I had talked to someone the other day who told me Kirk had mentioned in his staff meeting that he hoped to by the end of the month. You know, so that's still ambiguous enough to where we could be taking, taking, you know, two weeks is February 1st from today. So, you know, again, I think the timeline for Groundhog Day, which is appropriate, is is, is, is on the table. Um, I would hope that by the end of next week that they have somebody that's in play, you know, at least somebody hired or close to hired. So we can just kind of because this is an anxious moment, Chad, for all of us, for not only those of us who cover the program, because we have to watch this every day and it's, it's kind of a paranoia out there, but it's also, you know, the fan base, you know, so ever since two years ago when Brian got kind of elevated to from tight ends to quarterbacks to go along with his OC duties, it's been this aggravation and it just hasn't subsided. So it would be nice to try to uh, take this exhale and, now people can kind of be under looking forward to what may happen down the, the road as opposed to this, Oh, Brian, Oh, you know, and, and these constant jokes and, you know, some days they're kind of funny. Some days it's just completely irritating. So I don't know. Do you have a better prediction than I do on this? Uh, no, no. Uh, I'm, I'm, I was going to guess maybe the end of next week, but it's just a guess. Um, I just, I just know that the, the Chris thing was a setback. Um, mm -hmm. For them, it really was. I think I think that's who he thought was going to be. It would have made perfect sense. Good fit, personally, culturally, mm -hmm. stylistically. Um, you know, uh, knowledge of the Big Ten West. Mm -hmm. You know, all that stuff would have been really good. But uh, anyway, there's also a wide receivers coach spot to fill, Scott. So let's get to, to staff changes. I mean, spring football is going to be a blast once we get there. There's going to be so many. Um, uh, Topics to cover. We're going to have the new offensive coordinator. I don't. So with Proctor, I, I guess he probably can't enter until April, right? Correct. 
The what the, the the program or no, no no that's right no he can he can enter the portal because the Saban left I forgot yeah, well, yeah brain fart there I got a lot going on in my personal life yeah sure um <laughs> but uh okay good to, yeah I was just thinking gosh is, would Proctor be here so yeah he could be here this spring that would be fun new OC, yeah all this stuff and then you know Seth Wallace assistant head coach new wide receivers coach there's gonna be so much to write about let's what do you want to talk about out of that that mix of the coaching staff changes that they announced yesterday which kind of moved the conversation forward a little bit you know let's let's talk about kelton you know this was a move that i know most of us had heard or uh that was going to happen before it actually became official uh you know i know last week you know i was told that it was happening and and you know it, it's a move that had to be made chad you know we don't we build relationships with, with the coaches as well. So sometimes I don't like to say all the negative there, but you know, it, when you look at the four cl first four classes of players, he recruited for that position from 18 to 21, there were nine wide receivers, freshman wide receivers coming in. Seven of them transferred out one chose baseball and that's not his fault. I mean, Brett Brody Breck's going to be pitching in the MLB for a while. And then the other one is, is Nico Ragaini. Yeah. And you know, which was a Ken O'Keefe recruit, you know, uh, but he was also, that's the only one that stuck around. And then you'd look at, you know, a Charlie Jones and, and things like that. Is that all Kelton's fault? No. I mean, the, the offense is the offense, but did you see a lot of development out of those players? Did they really grow as players? Did they become important and impactful? Um, did they stick around? No, you know, there just wasn't, the production wasn't real good. And, and when you look at this year and, you know, was it Brian's fault? Was it Kelton's fault that, you know, somebody like um, Caleb Brown didn't really see the field very much until late in the season, you know, and maybe it's the player's fault, but, Ultimately, you got an Ohio State four star that just didn't see the field until you know November. I, I think you've, you've got to make a change. And with having a new OC, Chad, this really is is a great time for that because the the passing system has to be completely imploded. It has to start over again. And I think with uh, a new OC bringing in his, you know, pretty much bringing in his own wide receiver coach. I think now's the perfect time for that. Yeah. I mean, I was two sore spots positionally on offense, wide receiver and quarterback really uh, in the last couple of years have, you know, we're now going to get fresh blood, fresh voices, yeah. fresh eyes. And that's, I feel like that is needed. I believe, it, correct me if I'm wrong, Scott, but is this the first time Ference hasn't re, you know, renewed a contract since Chris White, Bobby Kennedy? Would that be the last time? Yeah. Because the ones that have left, you know, Paul you know, whether, yeah. You know, I mean, he was he became OC at Wyoming, you know, mm -hmm. um, and Derek Brown went to the NFL. Foster, yeah. Derek Foster, I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm praying for him. Yeah. But yeah, Derek Frost, Foster went to the, the Chargers. And, mm -hmm. and so those moves were, you know, their own, you know, officially. So I think in this case, it's, uh, you know, the, the first one since those guys. And, yeah. and uh, I, you know, and, and I think it's a really a good move. Um, it just had to be made. And, um, so now where do they go? You know, th now this is a spot potentially that somebody like John Budmeyer could have, mm. you know, now that, that may be a fallback or that may be something he's trying to, to build curry favor with, you know, <laughs> I'm sure anybody wants to be in, uh, you know, positional coach, but I, I think you, you give your OC the opportunity if he has, and, and the job has posted. So it posted uh, yesterday or two days ago. So um, they can get all the candidates, uh, you know, at this point. It does give Kirk Ferentz a little more flexibility, too, in who he hires as OC. If it's not necessarily a quarterback's guru, he can hire a quarterback's coach, you know. So there is a little bit of flexibility that a second that person could bring somebody with his staff, yeah. you know, or, or whatever. So I, I think that's a positive. And I don't, there's not as much of a rush on, naming a wide receivers coach in conjunction with the OC. Uh, certainly the OC, you know, is going to be the first hire. Now, they, would they, I guess they'd have to close the application before they hire a wide receivers coach officially anyway, right? Yeah, but I think having this started, this process yeah. already started in place, it has to be two weeks that, you know, you could have that interview and just say, 
I mean, come on, you know, they, yeah. they say, you're my guy. We just have yeah. to wait for this to close and, and what have you. But, you know, the, the other part, and I, what I'm excited to see a little bit is, um, you know, George Barnett has, has been, you know, is it him or has it been the offensive line? And is, are the pieces that he's worked with, are, they haven't been top shelf. I mean, they haven't been Tristan Wirfs, you know, you had Linderbaum for a year, but, you know, you've had a lot of inexperience and young players that have tried to grow. And, but now if you have a, a Caden Proctor, now we can see what, you know, is he, is he a good coach or not? And I think that's really, you know, if, if he goes out and if Caden Proctor takes a step forward and he, you know, and the, the rest of the line coalesces, then you can see what Kirk Ferentz has been talking about for all these years. So, and if not, then, you know, they can certainly hide him, <laughs> but, but uh, you know, I mean, cause Tim Polisek lucked out, let's face it. He had never coached offensive line before came to Iowa, learned how to coach, but he's also, he also had uh, Lyric Jackson and, and Tristan Wirfs and Tyler Linderbaum. So uh, that's just a, a side element to this, but I think it's also an important part of it. Let's give a few minutes to Seth Wallace before we move on to hoops, because that's a, a historic move. Kirk Ferentz naming an assistant head coach. Uh, you and I both have a lot of respect for Seth. I know that in the job he's done. Uh, I put it in my column the other day. People have told me privately, you know, that, that Ferentz and, you know, he who shall not be named, Chris Doyle, identified uh, Wallace as somebody with head coaching material a long time ago. Yeah. And I, I know Kirk sees him that way. Uh, Wallace told me for an article I did last year on him, you know, that he's kind of scratched that defensive coordinator itch at Valdosta mm -hmm. State. Uh, he, you know, we know that, that Minnesota pursued him heavily uh, this offseason and he decided to stay at Iowa. Um, so he knows, like, he, you know, as far as ego goes, he could be a defensive coordinator elsewhere at a Power 5 school. Um, mm -hmm. And basically, Phil, he is a defensive coordinator at Iowa. He's just kind of co with Phil, and Phil gets yeah. to coach defensive backs, you know. Yeah. And, and Seth gets to kind of more coach the front seven, but uh, he knows how they marry with each other. He's just such a valuable piece. What do you make of kind of that move? Uh, I've had a lot of people ask, like, oh, is this coach in waiting? No, it's not coach in waiting. But there is – I think Kirk Ferentz can, you know, move some stuff off his plate to Seth, and Seth can handle it. Yeah, this is a really interesting move and a really good move, I think, for Iowa because they've never had one of these before. And I think a lot of people may have wondered if like LeVar might might take that role. And I think LeVar probably could as well. But but for someone who has been heavily pursued, you know, whether it's, you know, Minnesota this year, Nebraska or Northwestern in the past and and some others, too. Some, he had opportunities going way back, which is why they had to elevate him to begin with. I mean, Boston College was very interested in him back in, I think, 16 or 17 or something. Um, so, you know, he is the type of, of coach that, that's going to get this kind of feedback. And you want to make it where it's difficult to leave. And he doesn't want to leave. He's from Iowa. He's His family all lives in the state and, you know, has grown up here. And uh, grandparents are nearby their kids. And that's what makes it tough. I mean, he had conversations with Purdue. Uh, you know, when Jeff Brom was the head coach there. And uh, so it, you know, makes sense that if you want this guy, if you value him, you put him in that position to succeed. And, and, and maybe it's, this is the one way to keep him as well, because, you know, position coach, assistant defensive coordinator, it, it doesn't probably do it justice because he, he's probably better than two thirds of, at least of the two of the DCs in the big 10 anyway. So giving him this opportunity allows him to grow as a, as a person, does it make him coach and waiting? No, but it puts him in that ballpark that if Kirk Ferentz retires in two years, that he has the clout to interview for that job and not just be a positional coach. And, and I think other programs can see this too, that he's the assistant head coach at Iowa. And now he's got the opportunity to be a, uh, a competitor or a competitive person for a head coaching job at other institutions. So it, it's a mutually beneficial situation, I think, for Seth, for Kirk, um, for the program. And, you know, and you're rewarding your, your achievers. And then with, with Phil Parker getting a $500,000 bump, you're also doing the same. Now, what's interesting, Chad, is last year it was approved for a $7 million 
uh, pool for your assistants, that's going to be blown up. Um, but football is football. If you're not in the, in the big game, then get out of it. And you've got to be, you know, you've got to be competitive salary wise and positionally to, to succeed. And when you've got a, a, a coach like Seth, who's coached first team all Americans and Josie Jewell, who is a two star from Jack Campbell, who, you know, won the Buckus award, who was sought after by three schools. And then Jay Higgins, who had one power five offer and he's a first team all American and coming back. And you've got a guy like Nick Jackson who wants to come back. I think you want to keep that intact and, and Iowa, maybe you have to overpay a little bit, but do it because otherwise there's not, there's more of a difference between Iowa and Michigan than there is between Iowa and Illinois or Purdue. If you've made it this far in the podcast, want to raise a glass to you uh, uh, and maybe a glass of Steeple Ridge bourbon. Steeple Ridge offers a high quality, delicious drinking bourbon. If you don't find Steeple Ridge at your favorite retailer or grocery store, ask for it by name. Steeple Ridge is distilled, aged and bottled in Iowa by Lonely Oak Distillery. My last thought on Seth is it's a good personal move for him, too, because uh, I believe he could be as assistant head coach at Iowa. They're going to have another good year defensively next year. You know, let's say a Mac opening comes up next year on the head coaching side. Seth is, you know, instantly gains even more credibility and potentially could get that job. And then who knows, maybe he could come back to Iowa someday. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I don't I don't put that uh, out of the question. I mean, Seth's only four. He just turned 45. He's a young guy. Um, anyway, and and also the other factor in this is they move him to one million a year, fill to one nine. I think the new OC salary will probably be in that one five to one eight range. Would be my guess, uh, mm -hmm. something like that. So they've, you know, Kirk has set the bar now where he doesn't have to pay the new OC more than he's paying the Broyles Award winner Phil Parker. He's kind of got that yeah. fair thing set up because we know Kirk's yeah. all about all about fairness. So anyway, last thoughts there. I you know all this stuff is gonna we're probably gonna be able to talk about a new offensive coordinator soon, but for now. It's been a lot of fun passing the hash on football. Let's go to basketball in our final few minutes here, Scott. Uh, I guess let's start with the, with the Iowa men, the resurgent Iowa men. Fred McCaffrey, now the winningest coach in Iowa history. Uh, a big Saturday game against number two Purdue coming up uh, at Carver. I think that'll probably be the best atmosphere we've seen this year, which isn't necessarily saying much for the men. But uh, excited to see this team playing really well again. And, uh, you know, Josh Dix, Owen Freeman, you know, Ben Crickey's been such a pleasant surprise. Uh, you know, Peyton Sanford's doing what I expected he would do. And they're just getting good bench play. It's a fun team to watch right now. I've liked this team since the beginning. It's just a matter of their been, being really young and, and trying to grow. And that, that's, that's something that you're going to get at a place like Iowa. And, uh, but this is also, yeah, as you mentioned, I'm excited to see what atmosphere you get for – for a longtime rival, you know, in Purdue, number two in the country, national player of the year coming in, Saturday afternoon game at Carver. We've heard over and over and over the complaints of, you know, when these games are going to be held and, and, and to get this opportunity, here you go. Here's your chance. And to see this team. And, um, you know, there, there are a lot of questions um, program wise as to, you know, why the fans aren't coming out and, we can address them or we can ignore them for now, but I think right now is a better time to kind of look at the team as a whole and say, you know, Owen Freeman, I mean, what, six now freshman of the week honors, really a fantastic young player. And Tony Perkins has really kind of become the player that you want him to be, you know, kind of the, the, the tough dude in the backcourt and, and becoming that point guard. And then Ben Crickey has been very solid dependable. He's your guy that's going to get you a minimum 15 per night, most of the time in the close to the 20 range. Um, and Josh Dix having an, his best game the other day against Minnesota and getting Fran a record that, you know, it was impossible to see when he, when I saw him walk off the tarmac in 2010, uh, you know, Cedar Rapids. Um, but, you know, he has the mark and he's had a lot of success at Iowa. And here we are, um, uh, you know, but, you know, and I think the fact that they've won three straight in the Big Ten, Chad, is, is a big deal because after starting 0-3 and, and the way they lost some of those games, it looked like this could be a really rough year. But now it sets them in on a course to where 
they're in position to make some strides. And, and, you know, the NCAA tournament is not out of the question. It's still a long ways away and there's a lot of work to be done, but I think that they've put themselves in that position to where you know, that, that they can be competitive for it. Yeah. And I'm, uh, I'm happy for Fran, honestly. I, I've developed a pretty good relationship with him. Uh, you know, we don't root for anybody, but I, I feel like he, off the floor, he's, he's a very kind and, and a nice guy. And I think it's fitting for him that, you know, Iowa went on a little surge here to get the record. It wasn't like, you know, Iowa improved a four and nine in Big Ten play, and Fran McCaffrey is your all time winningest coach. Like, they're playing at a high level right now. And, uh, you know, I think it, it's kind of fitting because he has brought this offense to a high level. And I mentioned, uh, mentioned to you off the air, and I know on a radio show the other night, you know, I experienced a loss in our family really recently and was sudden. And, and he uh, found out about that and sent me a text, you know, we're praying for your family. That, that meant a lot to me. And um, he's, he's a quality guy. Um, you know, I know, it, you know, it, it's not necessarily everyone's flavor, um, but uh, all the time. And, uh, but he's a good coach, man. He, he can coach offense that Iowa every year, no matter the, the pieces he's got, they can score the basketball. They're doing it again this year. So uh, it's going to be fun. And, uh, you know, I don't know if you want to, we talked a lot about Caitlin Clark already in, in previous shows, but we probably should mention the Iowa women 18 and one best start in Lisa Bluter history. <laughs> and that atmosphere on Saturday night was out of this world, Chad. I mean, it was uh, for a, the weather, you got to take that into consideration. And, but, you know, here it is Saturday prime time against an NFL playoff game. And they still got more than a million viewers. Gus Johnson was here uh, in Iowa City. And then the way they played against the team that won the regular season crown last year, you've got to look at this team and say, you know, we, we examine their flaws. We always look at them, you know, and like, oh, well, you know, this, 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 you know, when it comes to their, their post play or whatever. But you gotta you gotta stand up and applaud the way they're playing now is as well as they've as they played you know since last season late um, and then to, you know there was no let up with Wisconsin now Wisconsin should have been a little bit smarter than to, to try to bark at Caitlin Clark while she's on the floor you know the bench I mean like what are you doing you know don't don't wake up the sleeping dog when it can bite you. And that's what happened. And they got beat by 46 and it could have been 106 if the game would have lasted a couple more quarters. So, um, you know, they, they're rolling. They've got a big game on Sunday, you know, at Ohio State. Ohio State won at Maryland last night. Um, I think both teams look like they're capable if, if Iowa has an off night. But, you know, there again, this is the magic of the Caitlin Clark effect. They're, they're, it's going to be in a you know, a game on NBC leading into an NFL playoff game. Who would imagine women's basketball commanding that role? But that's where they're at. And, and so this is a team that's rolling. They're capable of losing. They're capable of losing on, on Sunday. if They don't play well, but they are really taking flight. Yeah, we always like to do a little bit of what we're working on. I know we talked a lot about your articles at The Athletic, so I'll point to uh, – had Jan Jensen on my radio show, our radio show yesterday at Hawk Central, so – about 22 really good minutes with Jan. Uh, we talked a lot about, you know, the development of this team, and they have really played small. They've decided to play small without Monica Sonano yeah. in a lot of ways. I mean, Hannah Stolke sort of becomes a five, even though she's a four. Sometimes Hannah's not even on the floor, and Kate Martin becomes the five. Yeah. But they're they, what they've done is they have gotten everybody to rebound. Sita Fulter is a great rebounder at her yeah. size. Caitlin Clark's a great rebounder. Kate Martin has been – a tenacious rebounder and uh, defensively they are better this year. So they're a little bit different identity this year. They just have such good coaching. Yeah. <laughs> Lisa Bluter and Jan Jensen and everybody else over there, you know, do such a good job. Um, they just, they're such good coaches and they get the most out of their team. They get the most out of Caitlin and um, yeah, they just deserve a lot of credit. Now Jan told me on the show and you guys should listen to the, the interview, but, this is going to be a big test for their defense, uh, especially on the road. You know, they think they've made progress in those areas, but they're going to find out on Sunday. So a really exciting week for Hawkeye women's basketball, men's basketball. Ahead, Scott, great show. Thanks for passing the hash with me. Yeah, exactly. I mean, we've, we've you know, one thing that 
I think we both respect is the history of the people who came before us in this state. And, you know, and Gus Schrader, you know, we passed the hash about was at the Gazette for 60 years, you know, whether after he retired, he was also, uh, you know, kind of a columnist at, 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 you know, and I think, but also at your place, uh, you know, some of the great uh, reporters of the past and, and of course, radio in this state is legendary. Jim Zobel, Bob Brooks, the big shoe, Ron Gonder, you know, even Gary Dolphin, you know, at this time. So uh, we respect the past. I'm glad we were able to do this, Chad, and uh, look forward to seeing you, my friend, here in the, in the near future. Yeah, should see a Saturday at Carver, I think, uh, against uh, an Iowa Faces Purdue. So that'll be exciting. For Scott Docterman, this is Chad Lysico. Thank you for tuning in to Legends and Listeners from the Channel Seed Studios. We will talk to you next Thursday right here on the Iowa Everywhere Network.